Right then, I am actually going to attempt to do a little tutorial on my lavender cloth, which I'm using for my uh, Cruel Boys. Now, as you can see on this model, I wanted to go purple. I wanted to feel lavender, but obviously, because they're a, a Cruel Boy, you don't want them to be too vibrant or at least that's not how I feel but I didn't want them to be dull and drab either or browns so it took a while to decide on a paint scheme and I went for obviously orange on purple and then a kind of very light skin colour with very dark wooden weapons and slightly kind of tarnished metal so this is how I went about doing my uh, purple. So I started off by using Screamer Pink and then I'll just show you my progress. So obviously make sure you always shake your paints really well. You can actually get proper industrial paint shakers but I don't have one of those. I've even seen people use old back massages to actually do it. And I've got some nice brushes, my, uh, my good quality brushes but just for the base coat, I'm just going to use this one here that I picked up at um, the range, I think it was. Anyway, what I'm doing over here, as you can see, I've got a little wet palette. So my wet palette is not a paid one. It's like literally made out of a wet paper towel and a sponge that's slightly damp to keep out in a bit of moisture now and then. Now, what I'm doing is I'm just getting my brush wet before I dip it in the paint. Now, what you can do as well then is, depending on how thick you want the paint, that's what your wet palette is for. So, I don't want too much of my brush to begin with, just while I put my initial coat down, because what happens is if you just go too thick on that initial coat, you lose all your detail, and it's best to do two coats slowly then rush I need a real camera I hate the way that my phone just never quite holds focus for very long hopefully it'll uh Regain focus in a second. Yeah, problem is when it when your camera goes off focus, you have to like spend a while. There we go. It's trying to focus on something in the distance. It's trying to focus on my paint pot. That's why. Now you can see I've started to run out of paint, so again just gentle dip in, back over to my wet palette, back onto the model. Now, the good thing about thinning your paints a bit is that they flow into the recesses so much easier. You know what, if you need to do two coats, do two coats, you know, don't force paint on just to speed up your painting. I know not everyone enjoys painting and it's not the why they're in the hobby. You know, people like to just battle sometimes and they just want to get the models painted up. But, oddly enough, um, I actually believe that <laughs> fate favours those who paint their models well. You know, I don't pretend to be an amazing painter. I'm not I'm not planning on winning any competitions with this paint job. I am literally just happy that I'm a good painter. Or at least I hope I'm I hope people think I'm a good painter. I suppose that's down to opinion, isn't it? Now you can see I'm getting to the edges now and using a big brush on the edges is not a good idea. So in a bit, I'm just going to go down to one of my smaller brushes. Oh, what was I thinking there? 
So this is another good reason to use thin paints because if you make a mistake like that, it's really easy to wipe it off. Don't know what I was thinking there, painting on this flesh. So I always keep a an old brush to one side here. If I make a mistake, I can get the I can get my mistakes pushed away quickly and say I've got rid of most of it so that won't affect when I'm painting somewhere else later. Right. Okay, and I'm gonna head start heading downwards to this. Again, I'm trying to be careful because there's a bit of rope there and when I was painting my test palette run uh, I got a lot of paint on that and I had to add more paint I had to re kind of undercoat the strap so I'm being very careful not to get too far into it you can see as well what I'm doing is I'm using the grey underneath so as much as I want these to feel like a certain amount of colour their their clothing is hardly ever going to go through a wash is it even a hand wash so again it's that feeling of of dirt of mess and the grey underneath will help bring that Okay, see, and it's starting to cover quite nicely now. Now, what I like to do is when I'm painting parts of the model that might be in shade or shadow, I don't quite water down as much. That helps to gain a certain amount of darkness and drabness in key places. So, I'm going to have to now start, now this is the problem, it's getting underneath things, you know, into recesses, like, into the shade and into the shadow that I've got to do next, and I've also got to get these little fine details up here, so, I'm just going to wash off this brush, and I'm going to head into using a slightly finer brush now, for this next part. So I'm going to get my Artis Opus Zero for this part. Again, I'm still going to thin that paint on my wet palette. And now I'm going to start getting into these little bits here. So you can see just above the waistline. It's that moment where you got to start slowing down your breathing. Okay. Whew. And I do actually want these undersides not to be as wet. So I want it less watered down this paint so that it creates a Deeper shadow. <laughs> oh, I've put far too much on my brush there. I need to really wipe that off. Good thing is uh, on the actual wet palette as well. Uh, once you've got a bit of paint on there, you can actually start dipping onto the wet palette to get your paint. Whew. Oh my goodness. 
yes, I do. I do find this very um, intense, and you can see there I've got a slight blob in the wrong place. So I'm just going to try and get my clean wet brush and just scrape that away. Yeah, that's why it's important to use a, like thin paint because they're easier to remove those mistakes. Okay, Whew. I'm gonna have to find a better way to position my camera because it's kind of in the way. Getting there. I said sometimes you just gotta slow yourself down and accept that it's gonna take a little while to get the next part done. Again, you can see how the paint kind of naturally falls into recesses as well if it's watered down a bit. Which again is a process that you really want to happen. Is I'm heading on to the, the the right difficult parts to do. This is why sometimes it's a good idea to keep bits like shields un, not glued on in the early stages and then you can just pop the shield off. But because I did this as part of my how to build, I've ended up obviously gluing it down now I'm regretting it because I can't get under the shield easily but I'm getting there it's just a bit <laughs> it's just about controlling my breathing as I go in <sighs> okay so I've gone, done that part now and then I'll try and make sure I've done all the re you know like all the edges up here. Obviously the other thing I'm going to try and do is get kind of in there too. I said it's just about being patient in the end and if you just slow yourself down and don't rush you will get a lovely paint job. Okay, Whew. right and now, oh. you can see here on his hood, I need to kind of just, uh, you think this that's difficult, wait until you try and paint the face and the skin without getting the second colour on it. Rush to get rid of that. Don't like mistakes. I'm always fast at doing that. I always, if I've made a mistake, I just try and fix it quickly as possible. Right. Now I'm going to get under here. Oh, and then again, on this side, get underneath. Oh. 
Ooh. Right, he's getting there. And the good thing is what I'm finding as well is because I'm taking my time with painting this part, the parts that I did originally are now starting to dry, which means that if I want to add a second coat, I can simply just go over it straight away in a second. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second. Just let me finish this. <sighs> right, then you can see that I slipped a bit. So again, it's just about being fast and getting that paint off quickly with a wet brush. Okay. Whew. <laughs> so I think that's my first layer done. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back over with another purple, like the same purple, just to darken it in key places. But I'm not going to do that everywhere. So I'm only going to do that in places where I feel I want a deep colouring. So watch how I'm going to do this. I think I've got to maybe put down my good brush because I shouldn't be using that like that. I shouldn't be using my good brush for minor detail, uh, for big areas. Yeah, This is a good set of brushes so you can see <laughs> I, uh, I cleaned them off thoroughly after each use okay now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on to a slightly smaller brush this time now I'm not going to put my, my uh, paintbrush there I've got some paint left on my palette over here you can see that there so I'm going to use that I'm just going to very quickly now I'm going to try and particularly get up into the shades, into those recesses. Okay. Again, you can see, not too much, but there's just this second layer here. I hope you can see, it's just adding some depth to the purple, but you can see I'm also moving quite quick movements on it. And that's because I don't want to sit too long in any place. I want to be very fast. And then you can see now that I'm going into this darker area, I'm slowing it down so more paint gets on it. Again, because that is a shadow and I want my shadows to be darker. Then again, moving back up to his hood. I'm going to be quick, I'm going to flow the paint fast and slowing it down to get into the recesses for darkness and then over here over the top again and then down here again it gets a bit darker because that's more in the shade. Okay, um, then now, whew, what I want to do is, really, I want to get, this is why I didn't glue them to the base while I was doing this. So let's see if I can pop them off now, because it's about getting under as well now. So you can see here, I'm kind of missing bits. <laughs> Then again, I'm going to try and get darker down here. Again, I'm just thinking about where my shade is. As you can see, I've been 
getting down under there. I'm trying to get, oh, you can see now, I'm going to try and flow the paint down into there. It didn't quite catch before. Whew. Right, and then you can see underneath its hood, you can see how because I've just took the base off, it's now easier just to get underneath. Even into his, under his cowl here. Okay, there is phase one. There is the initial purple placed on the model. So, as you can see, really, of course, takes a bit of patience, but it does start to pay off. And it doesn't matter what colours you're using. So, if you're going for a different colour, if you're going for browns or blacks or whatever. It's still a good idea just to do it slowly but surely. There we go. I'm happy with that. Right. I shall leave him for a little while to make sure he's fully dried. <laughs> and then I'll start my shading. Okay, so now that that's dried a bit, we're going to go on to the shading process. So, shading is done just to create shadow, basically. That's as simple as it is. So, I'm actually going to use a contrast paint to create shadows. But, obviously, you can also use what's known as oils or inks. So, depending on what you're planning on doing. Now, contrast paints... Are quite an interesting type of paint they create a very you can see they look very runny and you know they do have a runniness they're like halfway between an ink and a regular paint or probably not halfway but so similar and basically when you pop them on anything they create kind of very interesting effects because the color that it says it is doesn't always what what seems to come out because it's about what you've got underneath it now, I'm using it, as I said, as a shade, because I want a nice deep purple in the shade. And all I'm going to do is just very gently, wherever I want everything to be a little bit darker, I'm just going to run it across. You can see? So, I'm going to get a bit of darkness under there. This part here, where it's kind of like the inner thigh that's going to be darker anywhere like this where it's kind of like a, a crossover point and again I've thinned this a little bit using my wet palette and you'll be thinking to yourself well hang on a second that kind of just goes from one color to another it doesn't look right that's why later on I add other colors over it so you'll see as I go through how other colours will kind of help them blend together. Now, on these, I'm actually getting a thinned out contrast. And I'm running in between the joints here. I'm pushing it here. And I'm just trying to push it right into anywhere. That I think a shadow will exist. Again, getting underneath. And it's just really about thinking about where shade and shadow might happen. And over here, again, you can see I'm trying to get it underneath these points. 
I'm trying to get the between where the clothing stitch line is. Basically, you can see that I'm running it basically anywhere that I think a shadow is. Now, you're wondering why do I have to paint a shadow? Because surely the shadow exists, you know, <laughs> shadows just simply exist when I turn a light on. And it's like, yes, they do. However, when we're normally having a battle, we're normally doing it in a very brightly lit room. Which means that there's not as many natural shadows there would be if, say, it's the sun beating down on something. And this is the illusion that you're trying to create, really. You're trying to create sun, sunlight or moonlight or whatever kind of other light effect that you want. And again, right, you can see I'm really going to try and get inside here because obviously on the inside, on the inner parts, is really where the deep shadows are going to start coming in. Pop them off his base again so I can get underneath. And over here, because that's a very dark place. And also that's very deep and dark. Right then, and then what you can do as well is just gently, the camera keeps focusing on the paint pots, just in little tiny areas, but don't overdo it. Just where you've got folds in the cloth. It's just sometimes nice to get them there as well. And as I said, it may seem like, as I said, it's like, it, there's, there's a sudden change from the colours, but I'm going to solve that when I go on to the next type, next phase, which is going to be um, adding your layer on. So my next little phase now is to use some Emperor's Children. And with this... I'm going to very gently go over. Then I'm going to get my number one brush out. Gonna let it get a bit of moisture from here. Then I'm going to get that. I'm going to get slightly watered a bit. And then from here. I'm going to start applying it. Need a bit more than that. But... 
and as you can see it's just adding a light tone over the top of it now Now, obviously, I don't want to go too heavy at this stage. Again, like with the other layer, I'm trying to kind of get a tone on there without going over the top. If I put too much on, I'm just going to get it a bit wetter and push it around. I'm going to get it not fully into the recesses, though. So to start getting into the recesses, you see I'm not quite going as dark. Okay. And this is just starting to change that colour. Can you see? It's starting to push it slightly towards that colour now but not quite all the way. Now, once I've got this layer down, that's when I'm going to just very gently, I'm gonna end up dry brushing after this. So I, what I do is once I've got this a little bit pinker, You can see I'm being very careful not to wash in between now. So I'm not letting this pink get in between. And I'm trying to not put as much paint down here. So I'm trying to make sure that my or bulk of my paint is on the highest point and then I'm pushing towards the dark areas, but not too much. Now, I don't want to go again too much because that's a dark place under there. Again, it's just about picking where you start to paint and then moving into the dark areas from that point. As you can see, I want a lot more pink on the top of this than I do towards the bottom. And that gives a feeling that the light is coming from above and heading downwards. Uh, you can start to see that they are slowly becoming the same shade, although this has got a lot more highlights done on it, uh, which I'll move towards in during the dry brushing process. Now, this is the next bit that I need to do. I'll leave that out because I still need to wash that properly. Okay, you can see now I've got to get into these areas here, but with them being so small, I'm going to pop over to a smaller brush. Again, same thing though, I'm trying to not have too much on my paintbrush at any one time. I'm thinking about where my shadow is as well as I go through this. There they go. <laughs> okay, and then I just got to get in there as well again i've got to think though about how much paint i want there because this in particular is a darker area it's going to add a bit more of light on there i don't think it's got as much light as i want okay there we go right 
So that's our next layer done. Now, let me just very quickly get these brushes clean. And while that's sort of drying, I'll wash my brushes. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to increase the, the actual purple. Well, the actual pinky purple, whatever this one's called, the Empress Children. Now for this, I'm going to kind of do a dry brushing effect. So, you can actually buy specialist dry brushes and I'll show you one here. So, this is a, a dry brush that's quite, you know, it's a bit old now so unfortunately it's imperfect um, and that can unfortunately with dry brushes as they start getting older they they can be full of other paint colors as you go through and i found that you know i try and clean them up as best as i can and unfortunately after a while they just feel stained so uh dry brushing can be a bit of an interesting process just trying to now one thing the assumption is that hang on a dry brush you know you're going to have it dry um one thing that someone taught me once which i found quite interesting is have it slightly damp like imagine you've just toweled off your hair but not hair dried it right before you actually get the paint on it for the dry brush right so i've added some paint now from a dry brush then what i'm going to do is I'm gonna get some dry tissue. I'm gonna wipe some of it off. Now, what I'm trying to do, the reason I wet it is so that the paint kind of drills a tiny bit inside it. So that it starts to cover it. Can you see? So you've taken off a lot of the paint, but it's kind of worked its way into the bristles. Now, unfortunately, this is quite an old dry brush, so I have to kind of, use smaller less dry brush you know um, not dry brushes as i go through but to get just a large area this is fine this is technically a small dry brush but you can get smaller than this then what you do is you very quickly start to move over the model now what i'm trying to do here is i'm trying to move downwards and the reason I'm moving downwards and I'm not going side to side or back upwards is because I want to kind of get the impression of the light heading downwards onto the model. So dry brushing is a great effect to get a kind of... Here we go. Basically, like a little hit point of light as you go through. And it starts to lift the colour just slightly. So you can see these are starting to move towards each other as far as colour is concerned, just slightly. Now, I'm going to add a bit more paint on my dry brush and do the same again. I'm just going to work it in to my tissue. I'm going to head down here now, so to the bottom. You'll see what it started to do, it started to pick up the colour on the stitches and things like that. Now, of course, it's very hard to get a dry brush into recesses, unfortunately, into really tight areas. But the reality is, because your dry brush is usually adding a point of light, it's actually quite sensible that you can't reach into some of the recesses. Okay, and we're getting there. Now I'm just gonna add a tiny bit more. Get that all wiped off on the 
clock again. So I'm going to try now and get this way. Okay, and there we go. Uh, that's my key dry brushing phase now done on this. And as you can see, it's kind of just created in little areas some key highlights. Now, again, with it being a dry brush, I'm going to give it a good clean. This dry brush is getting quite old now, and I need to replace it. It's seen better days, and it's frayed, and it's you know, it's got other colours mixed into it, which isn't great. Obviously, that can start to ruin the look of your miniature. Okay. Then, from there, I can start to engage in a bit of highlighting. So, proper highlighting time. So, it's always a bit of a debate about whether or not you want to highlight or dry brush on highlights and I'm a great believer that actually if you want to you might as well do both so you might as well do a combination of both so I've got my fulgrim pink here and then I'm going to dab it now highlighting is when you pick out key little areas and you try and really pick them out in a bright colour So, like that there, yeah? Now, the problem with highlighting is if you make the highlight too severe, like I've done there, it can look unusual. So, it can look like it doesn't just quite work. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to really kind of get my highlight and then really try and kind of thin it out. And then, again, I'm going to apply it. But this time, it's a little bit more subtle. And there we go. So I have highlighted, but instead of like being very bright and very vibrant out there, it's really more just adding a lightness to a key point. Then what I'm going to do, is I'm also going to highlight on any particular edge that I can find or any particularly high raised point. And I'm just trying to make it as if like, well in this, I mean, sometimes if you're doing something like metal armor, then a highlight can show a sharp edge or a point of say light reflecting and you know, changing the color of the armor due to the reflection. So if you've got like a gold armor, the light reflection could be a silver, but this is actually a, piece of cloth that is getting old so what I'm actually going for here is you know fading and wear and you've got to pick your colors wisely on this one now what you'll find as well is you'll notice that as I'm going about this my brush is getting a bit dry now I like to take advantage of that just every so often by just doing a bit of dry brushing before I reapply some wet paint to it. Okay, I'm gonna do that again. I'm gonna get it back. Again, coming back and then more of this basically. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start picking out those little stitches here now again sometimes when the stitches are very close together should be able to dry brush them like that and pick them out nicely 
Again, around the back here, from gentle. I can just, there we go. Can you see how I'm highlighting them like this? Again, from here, I'm gonna brush downwards on him. A bit more paint on that. Here a bit more yeah and I'm just creating a whatever effect I want really whatever I like as I go you know and I don't tend to put highlighting there is what a, a process known as extreme highlighting which works great on things like metal armor um, particularly where there's no flats uh, where there's no like recesses where it's very flat and smooth But on this kind of model where there's mostly just nooks and crannies, I don't like extreme highlighting. I think it just goes too much and you end up putting highlights inside shaded areas. Okay, I'm just going to get around the top of this now. Right, and now what I want to do is now that this brush has dried out a bit, this is where I'm going to start hitting high points on the cloth. So basically I'm going through the model and I'm looking for anywhere where the cloth seems to sort of jut outwards a bit. So there I've got one. Basically, there's no other way to put it around his buttocks. Yeah, we've got a high points. And then if I come up to the top, we've got a lot of high points on here that I want to hit. And then down again. Really get the the highlights coming on this part too, yeah. Okay. Just uh while I'm at it, let's just do one little bit more around here. Right, okay, so that is how I am achieving a kind of worn purple lavender style piece of clothing. Now, as you can see, when you do stuff like this, you always have a habit sometimes of getting slightly two different effects. So obviously on this one here, it's a slightly deeper purple in some places. But what I'm trying to do is I'm not really trying to aim for identical every time because that just kind of spoils the mood that this is, you know, a, a group of orcs who are effectively, you know, either not very good at making things or they're stealing bundles of cloth and then turning them in. But there we go. Hopefully you like my tutorial on how to do a kind of faded purple clothing.